So welcome to the, today's webinar. It is a part of our resident series, Occlusal Splints, Diagnosis, Fabrication, Treatment. It is being presented by Dennis Urban, CDT, Director of Clinical Education, and we will begin the webinar shortly. And now it is my pleasure to turn the reins over to Adam Dreyfus, Corporate Account Manager for University, Government, and Institutions here at NDX. Take it away, Adam. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jessica, and happy and a healthy new year to everybody. We first want to, like I said, extend our wishes to everybody for a wonderful um, 2022. We really hope that um, you all did well at the beginning of your residency in 2021. We know that these are very interesting times that we're all going through, and myself, Dennis, Jessica, and the entire NDX team really appreciate your support as we continue to grow up this platform and other platforms. From the bottom of my heart, I do want to say thank you to everybody here. We all know that you have choices. We all know that you have opportunities to work with multiple laboratories and different networks, and we appreciate you choosing NDX and and really appreciate all the support. With that being said, I really do hope that you are staying warm today. It is the coldest day in New York um, in the last uh, two years. So I hope that you're not frostbitten and that you're all warming up in your clinics. As always, we know that your time is precious. So we will be ending this around 8.50 um, so you can get onto the clinic floor. Again, myself, Dennis, Jessica, and the NDX team, Thank you for all your support for 2021, and we're looking forward to an amazing 2022. And without further ado, I'd like to bring you Dennis Urban. All righty. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jessica. And good morning, everybody. And happy New Year. Uh, this morning, we have uh, a, a presentation called the Occlusal Splints, Diagnosis, Fabrication, and Treatment. So this is normally a two, two and a half hour program. So I did condense it into hopefully about 45 to 50 minutes. And we'll touch on a lot of the aspects I'm going to show in, in a minute here. But, you know, one of the most important uh, joints in the human body is a temporomandibular joint. And it connects the skull to the jaw. And it's also one of the most problematic joints also, you know, so uh, due to TMJ disorder or TMJD. And TMJ disorder results in pain, tenderness, swelling, and other symptoms around the face and jaw. And TMJ disorder is fairly common. And depending on the severity of the pain and discomfort that a patient is experiencing, it can also be fairly easy to treat and manage. So we're going to co uh, cover a couple aspects of that this morning, and we're going to get started with the webinar outline. So talk about examination and diagnosis, TMJ pain, centric relation, appliance types, fabrication, uh, digital versus traditional, some material science, patient acceptance, of course, one of the most important aspects, and goals and predictability. So let's get started here. And, you know, some of the FAQs that we usually get on uh, occlusal splint therapy is what is occlusal splint therapy? You know, it can be kind of confusing because there's a lot of different types of splints. So what kind of stuff type of splints are available and how does each splint work? And we'll cover that this morning. And which type of splint should be used and when? How often should splints be adjusted? And that's a very important aspect of it because we talk about adjustments. The lack of adjustments can lead to the failure of splints. So these types of splints and the failure of the entire treatment. So what is occlusal splint therapy? Well, simply it's occlusal splint therapy may define as the art and science of establishing neuromuscular harmony in the masticatory system by creating a mechanical disadvantage for parafunctional forces. So we're trying to, we're throwing off those natural forces in a way that it'll, it'll enable the patient to be, be more beneficial for the patient. And that's with a removable appliance and a properly constructed splint facilitates a mutually protected occlusion. So some of the terms, mouth guard, bite guard, bite plate, we have hard splints, soft splints, combination splints, full arch coverage, coverage of set several teeth for TMJ disorder or protection of natural dentition on newly restored restorations. And that's one of the splints we make quite often is, you know, when we're doing uh, full mouth re rehabilitation or full, uh, full mouth uh, uh, cosmetic type cases, uh, we wanna protect those cases, whether they be all ceramic, all porcelain, hybrid type cases. Uh, and we make these newly restored, uh, we can make a splint over these new restored, uh, new restored restorations. So really important. That's one of the great uh, positives of these splints also. Then the stabilization splints, and they prevent teeth from grinding and clenching. And the splint coverage are on all the teeth and typically just worn at night. 
Then we have our repositioning splints. We're going to go into this a little deeper in a little while, but I uh, just wanted to mention these on the onset. Uh, repositioning splints designed to correct occlusion and typically worn all day and every day. So how does splint therapy resolve issues? Well, splints allow the ligaments and muscles to relax. That's one of the most important things, aspects of making these splints. And it prevents the jaw reactions such as grinding and clenching, which a lot of you must know, people who do have a uh, clenching, uh, grinding, I know I do. And I, you know that first picture that we saw in the first slide, that was my mouth. And that was with uh, the splint that I made for myself. And, uh, you know, because I had a lot of grinding and clenching and, uh, you know, especially at night and it eliminates pain and discomfort. It helps bring inclusion to, into a more optimal position. So uh, there's different types of splints for those types of reasons too. And it offsets the negative effects of bruxism. And some of the signs and symptoms of unhealthy occlusion and wear, you've seen this wear fracture or chipping of teeth sensitive crevices on teeth or gums. I keep, I keep on going back to my own mouth because I noticed over the years, all the, after all the money I spent on uh, alignment and braces and everything like that, over the years, because of my, my, my grinding, my bite has closed. So you know, I'm to the point now where I might have to have new, new restorations made and open my bite a little bit because it's, it's closed quite a bit because of wearing of my teeth. So, and then the sensitive crevices on the teeth or gums and gum, gum, gum and bone reception, uh, recession rather, and the loose, loose or shifting of teeth. You know, it's loosening or shifting of teeth. And some of the signs of unhealthy occlusion, uh, worsening of periodontal disease, damage to dental bridges and implants. And uh, that's why it's, it's so important when we're prescribing these types of uh, cases, especially on, on bridges and implants that we utilize the right materials uh, for the right occlusal space. Tender muscles, headaches, and, and noises when you open and close your jaw. Sometimes you, you have this, uh, uh, this, these different noises when you can hear clicking, or you can actually hear like abrasive noises, almost like sandpaper noises when you open and close. So uh, that's a symptom of unhealthy occlusion also. So as we pretty much all know, occlusal forces can equal 500 pounds per square inch. That's a lot of force, you know? So, and when the jaws close, your teeth should come together evenly and at the same time without any tooth or teeth touching before on one another. When they don't touch evenly, this puts stress on your teeth, the supporting bone, jaw joints and muscles and clenching or grinding can magnify the problem. So let's look at the, some of the symptoms of the TMJ disorders here. So we have headaches, aching pain in and around your ear, joint locking and popping, pain in tendons or tendons in the cheek, cheek and jaw, pain or difficulty chewing, dizziness, sharp facial pain, deep ear pain, facial swelling. All those things are symptoms of TMJ disorders. And of course, neck and upper back muscle spasms. So all these have a play and there's the distance. Some people might have some of these, some, some patients might have all of these symptoms. So some of the concerns, we have a type of appliance. What kind of, what kind of appliance should we prescribe? The type of design, the length of the treatment, expected results. And of course we need patient acceptance. And one of the most important things, like I mentioned before, patient compliance, complying to what you tell the patient to do with these appliances. And those expected results are going to result in decreased pain, increased TMJ range of motion, better occlusal efficiency, ongoing increased improvement, and a splint design with quality material is so important. So, uh, you know, and that's what we do here at NDX. We design it with FDA materials and they're, they're you know, it's, it's, it's quality materials that hold up. So different splints hold up to different uh, uh, environments in the mouth also. And we want to protect the TMJ from dysfunctional forces and stop the possibility of perforations or displacement. And we'll, show, we'll talk about those, the ligaments in a little while. And we also create a stable and balanced occlusion. Create harmonious relationship of all muscles, discs, ligaments, and bones. So all these ex are expected results and all, all these ex uh, results can be achieved with compliance and the right, uh, you know, the right appliance. So this is an article, uh, information from an IDT article, Inside Dental Technology and from Dr. Leonard Hess. And this is a couple of years ago, he wrote this, uh, this article in IDT Magazine. He's a senior faculty of the DOSC committee. And you know, when it comes to bite splints and occlusal splints and, and therapy and things like that, Dawson has it you know, uh, under control. I mean, they, they have, it's amazing the information and the success they've had over the years. So first thing we have to look at with patients is their oral, oral medical and dental history. 
Evaluate the range of motion in the mouth also with the TMJ because TMJ problems can limit that range of motion. And then there's something called the centric relation load test. And we talk about all those forces with occlusion. Do that centric relation load test and, and that'll give you an idea what kind of condition the patient is in occlusally. And of course, we wanna evaluate the dentition where a CBCT or MRI is necessary, if necessary. I think it is necessary on every case just to be safe. And when you analyze the disc and lig ligaments, we look at the discs and the disc is the cushion that separates the lower jaw from the skull base. And those ligaments help to tether the disc to, to the mandibular condyle. Sometimes we have perforations in those areas and we'll talk about that. So, uh, and we have two ligaments. One is close to the skin. That's a lateral collateral ligament, as you probably all know. And the other is located in the deep part of the joint or the medial collateral ligament. And I have a picture here of the analysis of the disc and ligaments. And you can see the two ligaments and the disc here. You know, so this is where all the problems lie. And it could be a number of various problems had uh, caused uh, by these, you know, this, these types of pro uh, problems with TMJ disorder. And we have to find the right appliance for it. So one or both collateral ligaments may be injured in one or both joints at times. And trauma or disease can cause any combination of collateral ligament stretching or tearing. And the result of a ligament stretching or tearing in that disc may or may not dislocate or herniate in that part of the joint with the ligament uh, damage. And that is one of the reasons why TMJ damage can vary from patient to patient. There's so many different symptoms. And then we talk about disc herniation. You know, we talked about CT or MRI. It is advised to diagnose herniation, but I would just, I would, you know, as, as a norm, utilize a CT or MRI on any case. The TMJs may be quiet or they may click or pop. You know, they might have crepitus or sandpaper sounds. And I've heard these with different people over the years because we made so many appliances. And I've been in the operatory when these, uh, when the diagnosis was done. And in a normal TMJ, the condyle can move forward away from the ear or backward, backward towards the ear. And if this disc is not herniated, then the point should not make any sounds as the jaw is opened or closed. And if a ligament stretching allows the disc to herniate, it will slip out of place when the jaw is closed. So when that jaw opens, a snapping or clicking sound usually represents a reduction of the condyle beneath the disc. And that's not good. And upon closing, the condyle typically slips off the disc again, and the pop may be heard upon closure. So let's look at the appliance choices with these occlusal splints. There's a lot of choices out there. I can't cover all of them today. You know, one of the most popular ones over the years has been the Gelb appliance. And I probably made thousands of these in my laboratory over the years. You know, that was the most popular, one of the most popular appliances in my lab at the time. And we'll evaluate that in a little while. But, uh, you know, that was just pretty much hard acrylic with a lingual bar and a couple of ball clasps on posterior teeth, opening that bite and keeping that patient in a, in a comfortable position. And we'll go through each one of these. And then it's the NTI appliance. We'll elaborate more on all of these in the upcoming slides. And that flat plane appliance, that's probably one of the most popular ones over the years is that flat plane appliance. But a lot of times these were diagnosed for patients who were clenching and grinding and you know, other problems weren't looked at over the years. So a lot of patients had detrimental effects, but a flat plane appliance is probably one of the most popular appliances with a hard material. And then we have a relaxer splint, which I'll talk about in a second. We have something, some new technology with CAT CAM technology uh, called key splint soft clear. And now we have a key splint hard clear also. And then we have anterior guidance on the splint that I showed you in the beginning. This is a picture on my mouth here. I've been very happy with this kind of design over the years. I might try a key splint soft in, in, in a few months, but uh, this anterior guidance splint has been working very well for me over the years. So again, relaxer, we have something called a relaxer, the comfort hard soft, Bruxies, remedies, and we'll go through these in a second with explanations. Key splints, soft and clear, hard acrylic splints, and the Gelb appliance. So a lot of choices, and these aren't even all the choices out there on the market. So we talk a relax about a relaxer splint. It's a custom fit anti-clenching device, device that it provides relief from migraine headaches and jaw disorders. And you can see on the anterior region, there's a little ramp there, and it's gonna alleviate any stress on the jaw. And it's full arch coverage on these types of cases. And normally this is made at, at pretty much like a harder, harder acrylic material. So, and then we have our harder acrylic splint appliance, which is, which is all hard acrylic. And these splints have a hard acrylic surface. 
And one thing to remember is there's a lot of acrylics there on the market. So uh, there's a lot of laboratories, you know, in the industry or even dental offices that are using acrylics, which are soft. They don't have any high impact resistance or, or uh, flexural strength, and they wear down in no time. So you have a, a patient that is a bad bruxer, you really want to make sure you're utilizing the right acrylic on, on, uh, uh, for these types of splints, because there are softer acrylics out there, which will, will gr you'll grind through in no time. And then we had the bruxies and remedies, splint appliances, and these splints relieve patient stress and bruxism. They also protect from uh, new leak restored cases, like I mentioned earlier before, and they're made up of heat cured elasticized acrylic, something like the splint I showed you that I'm wearing. I'll elaborate on that in a minute. And remedies is a hybrid type made out of a heat cured acrylic for heavy, heavy bruxers. And then we have a key splint, which is a three, 3D printed material, and it's uh, has comfort and flexibility. And you can twist these by splints and they go back to their original shape and a lot of strength and accuracy with these new CAD CAM appliances. And I'll show you how we design these appliances in a second, in a little while. So, and then there's a gilbert appliance, which I made probably thousands of them. I had, to, had uh, you know, the opportunity to speak to Dr. Gelb recently. And, um, you know, I told him about all the appliances we made in our laboratory over the years. And, you know, he's, he's doing some really advanced, more advancements on these types of appliances also as we speak. But we're just covering the occlusal surfaces of the posterior teeth. And usually I'm, I'll make it like you see here. The only thing I won't do is have three ball clasps on each side. Usually I'll, if, if the retention is good enough, I'll utilize, utilize one ball clasp between the uh, second bicuspid and the first molar. And it's for mandibular orthopedic repositioning and mostly it, they're worn during the daytime. And it has been shown in evidence-based research to treat temporal mandibular joint disc displacement, headaches and sleep disorders effectively. Very comfortable, you know, you have that lingual bar, it's almost like a partial denture, that lingual bar, they come with that, you have, to have these prefabricated lingual bars that you can adjust and adjust to the lingual of the lower, lower uh, part of the uh, jaw there, so. And there it is in the mouth. This is a gelb appliance shown in the mouth. It's a little high with the, uh, the uh, occlusion here, but you know, some, you know, sometimes patients need more opening for more comfort. So there's your gelb appliance, one of the more popular ones out there. And again, the comfort hard soft appliance. This is one of the more popular ones also because it's hard on the outside and soft on the inside. Side. And these two layers uh, you know, are really comfortable for the patient. I have my own method of making these types of appliances and I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute also. I don't mean to keep you on the edge of your seats here, but we have a lot of stuff coming up towards the middle and towards the end of the presentation. And so this is a very comfortable uh, appliance. It goes over the undercuts easily, doesn't uh, irritate the, uh, the, the gingiva or the cervical areas in the mouth and they're very comfortable and they work very well, so. And then we have something called the NTI appliance. And this was, you know, this has been very popular over the years. And you can see it just covers pretty much the centrals uh, and sometimes the centrals and laterals, you know, so, uh, and it's a little ramp on the anterior region and uh, really, really works out well, you know. So this NTI appliance has been growing in popularity over the years. It's a small appliance, works well. And, you know, it's they call it the no susceptive trigenimal inhibition tension suppression system. And that's a mouthful. So it's a small plastic device that is, designed to prevent headache and migraines uh, caused by teeth clenching and grinding. And, and the objective is to relax the muscles involved in clenching and teeth grinding. And it works really well, you know? So normally when I used to make these, I used to make them over four anterior teeth instead of two, just for a little bit more retention. And, but the original design is over two, two centrals. And uh, so this is great, great appliance and it's designed to be a deprogramming device also, and really can't be worn more than six or eight hours a day without the risk of tooth drifting or eruption. And uh, it helps elevate a muscle shutdown at around 70 to 80%. And when those posterior teeth are not in touching, and this can greatly reduce inflammation in TMJ. So another great appliance. And then we have dual arc splints. So this is a long-term deprogrammer. And uh, you know Dawson used to make uh, uh, recommend a lot of these. We made a lot of these over the years in the laboratory. So I worked at in my own lab and uh, it's just a long-term deprogrammer more more involved than the other uh, types of appliances and uh, there's no contact on the posterior teeth. And then we have our flat occlusal splints, splints and they're, they're the relaxation or stabilizing splints and they're widespread and these are constructed for the upper or lower jaw, you know, so either, either or. Let's see if my time is here, oh, plenty of time, okay. So and then those flat flame splints, the occlusal thickness of the splint has been addressed in studies and one of the studies from man is uh, showed that splints that increase vertical dimension you know by at least four millimeters and up to eight millimeters that's a lot of that's a lot of openings uh, there right there but more effective 
in producing muscular relaxation in patients with bruxism and myofascial pain uh, in dysfunctional patients than one milligram splint. So the, well, the more they opened up these splints and opened up the patient's pipe, the more comfortable the patient was. So, and also studies suggest that a minimum of four millimeters uh, increase in vertical dimension is necessary to protect bruxing, bruxing patients. And when I used to look at these measurements, I used to say to myself, four millimeters, that's a lot. Yeah, you know, when you're opening up an articulator four millimeters, it looks like the opening is really, really open on the anterior region, but many times those posterior teeth are almost contacting. So that's why you really have to look at the opening on these, on these, uh, uh, on these bite splints also. So, so if the patient is wearing a splint that's four millimeters in thickness and still experiencing uh, muscular soreness, headaches, or facial pain, uh, then that should be, thickness should be increased. And this is my splint here. This is the K9 guidance. This is made with a material called Astron. And you can see I have anterior guidance on the anterior region there uh, from the cuspid to cuspid, cuspid disclusion, very comfortable. And uh, you know, it's, if you put this in hot water for about five to seven minutes, it kind of softens up on the inside and it goes over those undercuts really easily, you know, and, and a lot of the splints that are made on the market, when I teach this in my hands-on courses and, and my, um, my regular lectures, and I'm teaching technicians, many times those interproximal areas are not relieved enough. And this is where patients can experience pain. So I always make sure interproximally, I'll relieve those areas with those sharp areas. So those areas are going to really cut right into the, into those teeth there and uh, 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 attack the, uh, cervical and ginger areas because that's, it gets sore and you can't, then you have to take them off and you can't wear them. So proper product, uh, manufacturing of these is also really important. And there's another picture of the cusp of the exclusion that I just talked about. And the other thing different with mine, when, yeah, this is going into the cusp of the exclusion. I do have, um, uh, areas where you can tell when I'm biting into those areas on the posterior region a little bit deeper. So I, I preferred it that way. I felt more comfortable that way. So and that involved uh, that involved uh, regular uh, adjustments for about a month. You know, until I got comfortable with it. So when you talk about occlusal appliance therapy, the design must utilize anterior and chondral guidance to ensure the exclusion of those posterior teeth and those types of appliances I just showed. You know, especially with complex restorative procedures, including the change of occlusal uh, vertical dimension or or a jaw position. And a major advantage to occlusal appliance therapy is that the treatment is reversible and non-invasive. And the dentist must carefully adjust those appliances, like I mentioned, at the time it's, it's delivered and periodically thereafter. So, you know, you really don't want to just give it to the patient and say, go home, good luck. You don't want to do that. You want to really look at this as, as a regular treatment. Yeah, so it is therapy. Yeah. Some weekly uh, adjustments, some monthly. You know, so it, uh, in some severe cases, as much as twice a week sometimes with these types of cases if they're really severe. And it depends upon how quickly your discs move and try to fully recenter into the TMJ. You know, and uh, where that, you have to really convince that patient to wear that splint that's prescribed, or we're not gonna make any progress, you know, and, uh, and wearing the splint at night and while you're asleep, asleep is important also. So, uh, and after several splint adjustments, a relatively stable, healthy, reproducible hinge position of the jaw occurs. It's amazing. So it's really not that involved. If you look at it, you know, for these, these cases where, you know, the, these average cases or simple cases, you know, it's, it's really not that difficult to achieve that, that, that reproducible hinge position. So you look at underlying issues, you know, sometimes after stabilization of the jaw is achieved, it is then time to correct the underlying issues. Like I was talking about uh, earlier with my mouth, you know, just a comparison. I'm going to have to get, uh, you know, I'm going to probably have to get restorative uh, work done on, especially on my posteriors here because I'm overclosed. You know, if it's not addressed, occlusal abnormalities, abnormalities originally present, they'll negate any progress already made with splint therapy. Real important there. And to avoid occlusal changes, all patients with any appliances must be instructed not to wear these all the time because, you know, uh, we have, really have to check on that also. So, so we talk about stabilization splints. You know, these are effective in management of TMJ arthralgia, and that's what we call TMJ pain, or capsulitis or synovitis. And currently, the resistance splints are the most popular appliances for deep bite correction. And they load the incisors for an intrusive effect, uh, but leave the posterior teeth uh, free to erupt. And studies that involved the vertical changes of molars and incisors with bite plane treatment found that alveolar height in the molar region increased with minimal change in the incisal area. And this intrusive effect is on the incisors and, and is the best minimal. So these work very well. And it's pretty much, they consist of an acrylic platform 
anchored to the maxillary dentition. They talk about clasps here. I, most of the time, I'm not putting clasps on these. Uh, if they need more retention, if the tooth is not really undercut, then I'll put those clasps on there. So, uh, and it's not advisable to disocclude those posterior teeth by more than two millimeters at times because it's a, a close, it allows close supervision and follow-up, you know, and uh, we don't want any sudden uh, TMJ or myofunctional changes. So as far as nighttime bite splints, you know, we want to prevent, to, that's mainly worn for those, for, to prevent those teeth from wearing. We want balance and support to relieve tension in the jaw joints and to open up the bite and create more space for your tongue. And this also improves energy flow throughout the body when you open that, that, uh, that space up. And especially during sleep to improve your airway and breathing and facilitate a refreshing night's sleep. So, uh, and of course, reducing the clenching and, and grinding. So let's look at a couple of the classifications of bites. Then we'll go into, let me see what time, time we have here. Good, good time. Okay, good. And then we'll go into the digital aspect of it. So Okusin, if you look at Okusin study, Okusin classifies splints as a muscle relaxation appliance, stabilization and stabilization appliances and used to reduce muscle activity. And it also classified anterior repositioning appliances and ortho orthopedic repositioning appliances. And some of the other ones are anterior, posterior bite planes and pivoting appliances and soft resilient bite planes. And we look at uh, you know, their classifications compared to uh, Dawson. Dawson classified splints as permissive splints or muscle deprogrammers. They really went in depth into the, the science behind all this. And they have directive splints and non permissive splints and also pseudo permissive splints, that is, soft splints and hydrostatic splints. We don't have time to get into all of that today, but we can get into that another time. But um, so when you talk about permissive splints, they allow the unrestricted movement of the mandible against the appliance. And, and most splint therapies fall into this category. And this is also some information from Dr. Leonard Hess from that IDT article. And you can look this up online too. Just go to Aegis Communications, A-E-G-I-S, and look for IDT article with Leonard Hess. And uh, again, he's a senior faculty, faculty at the Dawson Institute and Dawson Academy. And directive splints direct the mandible into a predetermined position. You know, these types of appliances should be used with great caution and for only very limited periods of time. Permanent occlusal changes can occur with the use of improper directive splint therapy. We are very careful about that. An example of directive splint would be an anterior positioning device that situates the mandible into a position that is anterior to the maximal incuspation. So let's get into some of the material choices here. Uh, we talked about material choices uh, before. Let's get into more of the uh, in deep in depth here. So the Astron Clear Splint we'll talk about, that's what I wear. There's something called Urquident, which is a vacuum form material, material in different hardnesses and different thicknesses. And the machine actually has an articulator attached to the machine while you're vacuum forming. So that's pretty cool. Then we have the Comfort HS, hard soft, hard heat sure acrylic, then something called Versacryl. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute also with that, especially with the hard clear acrylic uh, and something called Primatech. These are just some other choices on the market. Again, I'm not even covering all the choices that are available. Then we have Key Soft. So clear splint material, this is what I wear. I, I, I talk about this all the time. I'm very happy with it. That's why I talk about it. It's a very, very nice splint, works well. I have a couple of extras here I made for myself just in case, you know, and uh, it's basically get a powder and liquid and it's self-adjusting. We mix this up, we, we process it in a lab, we process it in a flask or we can process it with in putty material. Uh, I was going to get into the processing aspect of it today, but there's just not enough time you know, in 50 minutes to do this. So, um, and then with something new with, uh, as far as CAD CAM, so we can design this on a computer and actually mill these out of CAD CAM material or clear split material. So, you know, before I had to wax these up, duplicate the model, model, block it out, wax it up, invest it, boil out the wax, cure it and finish and polish it. And now we have the CAD CAM technology for that. So, and we use a milling machine and it works really well, you know, with this, this material. This is that that machine I was talking to you about before. This is a pretty cool machine. You know, some dental, dental offices have this in their office also, but there's, there's different programs, but different materials, different thicknesses, different types of uh, appliances. And it has a, an attached articulator, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, which works very well. And these are just some of the different types of thicknesses and uh, different types of materials. We believe they even have a hard soft material also uh, on this, uh, this type of uh, a product. <clears throat> so uh, with VersaCrub, now this is a, a great material also. Now what I do when I make my hard soft my bite splints, I'll take this VersaCrub material, after the splint is processed, I'll ream out the inside of the splint, 
I'll put VersaCryl inside and mix this up. And what's great about mat this material, it comes with a hardener and softener uh, liquid. And if you put more softener in there, it's going to be more a little softer. And the same then vice versa with the hardener, hardening liquid. And so um, I'll have my model, I'll have my articulator. And after everything's finished with the, uh, with the bite splint, I'll just ream that inside out for about two to three millimeters, maybe a little bit more. I'll heat up, I'll, I'll mix up this VersaCryl, put it in the bite splint, put it on the model and close the articulator. And I'll cure it for about 20 minutes in the pressure pot. And it is one of the most comfortable appliances out there. So you have a uh, you know protection on the occlusal uh, surface, but a hard surface, and then you have a comfort comfort zone in the uh, interior region. It really works out well. And then it's something called Prematech. This is great for a quick splint. It's a light cured material. What I usually do is block out the cervical areas and interproximal, and then I apply this around the teeth. And you can separate her on the model and separate her on the opposing. Put it on the articulator, and you can form it and put it in a light cured unit for about five minutes and you can see it here. So it's not the ideal, the clearest material on the market, but it works, works really well. And I, I actually utilize this in, on the implant side when I make verification indexes because there's, there's no shrinkage or expansion of this material. And it comes in like little ropes here, really nice, easy to use, little ropes you can just uh, adapt it to the teeth very easily. And then there's something called acetyl resin. And this is an uh, injectable material and now it's millable. Uh, it's great. You can see this patient, this patient here had an overclosed bite. So we can see here, you can actually see a check line in number nine because so much force is on this patient's teeth. And so we made an appliance here covering the lower, uh, you know, the, the, the um, mandible there and uh, all the lower teeth. I opened up the bite a little bit and this was very comfortable. It was it really aesthetic. I mean, it's okay. It's kind of monolithic. It's not truly aesthetic, but it's on a lower. So it was kind of difficult to see. And you can see before and after here. So it looks aesthetic, looks nice, it's cleansable. Patient can take it out of their mouth at uh, regular intervals and clean it, but it snaps right into place, works really well. And uh, this was done by injection uh, previously, and now we can do this with CAD CAM also. So another before and after photo. This, this patient's gonna have to get something done on uh, their number nine tooth also with that, that check mark in there. If you can see it's ready to fracture. And there's the final appliance, really worked out well. So that's another option there. And it comes in uh, millable material too, called Zerlux Acetyl LTD. So let's see how much time we have here. Perfect. Okay, we're going to get into some of the digital aspect of things now with digital technology and bite splints. I love this technology. It's making life a lot easier for both the dentist and the dental technician and the laboratory. Uh, you can scan uh, the patient's uh, teeth, send our SD STL file in the laboratory, and we can do the rest. So we'll get into that in a minute. So. Oops, I'm going backwards here. Let me go forward. Here we go. So some of the advantages of digital versus traditional, you know, no impressions or impression material is necessary. By registration can be scanned. No gypsum is needed. It reduces material and labor costs and also reduces chair time. And we have a digital impression that's emailed to the laboratory, you know, and many design options, multiple software choices. And the file is always available if something happens. If the dog eats the bite splint, or the patient loses it or breaks it, we can always e easily print or mill another uh, bite splint. And it's various printable choices with soft and hard splints, as opposed to, and also uh, millable choices. So, and in a dental laboratory, you know, time savings for us, we have no model support, a virtual articulation. We have a quick design with splint, and printing time is much less than acrylic curing time. A lot less, and I think I might have some information on that in a minute. And you know, the printed materials are good for soft and hard splints. No gypsum, no wax, no duplicating material, no acrylic. Uh, so it really saves a lot of time and money on on materials. But they, you know, because of the time savings on the other materials, you know, they they, they are compensating for the charge and some of the uh, new newly printed materials. So the printed materials seem to be, I mean, the billable materials seem to be a little more expensive than the printed materials. So scan is accurate, the fit is precise. The file is stored for later if you need it, and uh, it can be designed to see splints with cuspid disclusion or anterior ramps. Pretty cool. And I go, hey, here's a time comparison here between traditional, you know. So the poor model and duplicate usually an hour and 45 minutes. For, this is for us in the laboratory, you know, unless you're doing this in a dental office, which I doubt. But and we wax, flask, pack, and cure the traditional way. That's a total of five hours and 15 minutes. So that's a lot of time there, you know. Now with uh, you know with uh, digital, we get the file, we design, we nest, we print, and everything's done in 55 minutes. Pretty cool. So we save a lot of time, and the results are predictable. And then we have a post cure, 
you know, so that we have to do after this is that the, the initial cure is done. So it's a total, that's 25 minutes. So it's a total of 80 minutes <coughs> altogether. So there's your virtual articulator that we have here. You can, you know, we'll show some, uh, a few more pictures uh, that, uh, in a little while of uh, opening the articulator, but this is with free shape. This Exacad uh, software that you can utilize here. You can put this on the articulator, you can open the bite. It helps you design. Here's your upper bite splint design here, as you can see here, very easy. If you like what you see, then you can go right to the printer. Then these are just some of the design op options with occlusal thickness, peripheral thickness. You can smooth it out. You can you know, alleviate undercuts. That's with Exacad. And there's a virtual articulator with Exacad. And it's a fully adjustable articulator. So this is really important. So as all the functions are fully adjustable articulator only in the digital form. And then you have your choices with different, uh, you know, uh, printers also, you know, there's, car there's so many printers out there. I just wanted to show a couple. You have carbon, um, car and free shape. There's a lot of different printers that you utilize. A Sega is one of them also, you know, it's another uh, uh, great printer, but uh, a lot of choices out there. And so this is the key splint material. This has been new, new on the market for about a year and a half now. And comes in, it's, it's just released the key splint hard. They have the key splint soft now. I think Jessica has one of these appliances. She's very happy with it. And then there's a Panthera night guard. And this is a cool also. This is a, you know, a, a really nice design on here. It's, it's probably, it's, it's, uh, has great comfort and robust. And it's thought to be the smallest full arts night guard on the market, you know, and it's consists of a polyamide, polyamide nylon material. And it's a pretty much the same 3D printed material used in the fabrication of the these sad sleep apnea and oral appliances. And it's a medical grade material that's rigid. It really works out well also. And all this is done by uh, uh, CATCAM and it enables undercut. So you don't have to worry about ball clasps, you know, which, and you know, I didn't mention this before, but ball clasps and those types of clasps that you we bend for these other appliances, if they're not done correctly, they can really encourage tooth movement. It's almost like an orthodontic appliance. So this is another great option, Panthera night guard here. Uh, finishing these night guard, this printed night guards are very easy with key splint soft. They take a carbide burr. You can adjust it easily. Usually no adjustment is necessary on these. Very, I mean, very little adjustment as far as thickness goes. You might have to adjust the occlusal surface, but not the thickness of it. You know? And then once these are finished, you know, curing, we have to, we have to cure you know, for about 25 to 30 minutes total, you know, for these uh, types of uh, uh, these post curing units, you know, and then we have this IntelliTray one, which really accelerates this, the final curing, and that's a four minute post cure. But the difference is, I think in these machines are about, uh, yeah, so it's a lot more money. So it's a lot, yeah, it's a lot more expensive. So, but, um, so this is the design here. We have a scan model here. This is the STL file we got from the doctor. We scan the upper and lower model. There's a virtual articulator. This happens to be an Artex articulator, really works well. And so you see the bite is still closed here when I open that bite. And when analyzing in here. And then the bite is, uh, is uh, slowly being opened here. And we want to get the desired opening here and then design our bite splint. And then we can start designing. Everything's blocked out where we need it to be blocked out. If we want more block out in certain areas, we can add it. There's your upper arch. Is when everything's ready to be designed, and uh, this is going to be the size of it. And there's your uh, designed um, uh, bite splint here, and it shows you the thicknesses. Sometimes we have to might have, we have, might have to add a little bit more thickness to it, especially in the posterior region. We go back uh, and look at it at occlusally, make sure there's enough room, and there's back on the articulator. We go into different excursions. We can add a ramp to it. We can have the cusp of the exclusion. We can have no indents on the upper, you know, from the occlusion on the lower. So it can be made on the upper or lower. A lot of different aspects of making these. So a lot of choices, really exciting technology. I love it. You know, so it makes life a lot easier in uh, with dental technology. And there's in the nesting stage, after everything's designed, we send this over to the printer. We set up the, uh, the, the, the printer with the correct uh, uh, parameters. And this, this is the nesting stage here, as you can see. And there's a live shot of the nesting stage right here. So it looks pretty cool. And this is not, this is when it's not, not even cured totally yet. So great freight bikes, you know, freight options for bike splints out there, but a lot of that, a lot needs to be looked behind what we're doing in order to design these correctly. So while occlusal splints are effective for managing things like teeth grinding and bite occlusions, it's important to note that they aren't necessarily a permanent fix for them. And that's where dentists may recommend additional treatments, which include the likes of orthodontics, specialized dental work to adjust occlusion and even surgery 
to ensure that individuals don't fall back into bad habits. And for example, those wearing a repositioning splint, the bite may have changed as a result. However, failure to wear that splint will cause the bite to fall back into the same uneven alignment. So remember, the type of splint utilized is dependent, is dependent on a diagnosis and a careful medical dental history along with a comprehensive examination is necessary for all patients, but especially for those with facial pain, TMD and bruxism. You know, for the specific diagnosis of TMD, the familiarity with application of splint therapy for the patients with occlusal related disorders can be one approach to treatment of affected individuals. And proper diagnosis and fabrication of the appropriate device can often result in a release, relief of symptoms. With that, I want to end the presentation here. And if you have any questions, I'll, be, I'll try to answer them for you if we have time. But thank you for joining us today. And I really appreciate it. And I hope I give you some good pertinent information. Yeah. Dennis, thank you again so much for uh, sharing your knowledge. I did not realize that dental, uh, the dental industry was a phenomenon in dancing with popping and locking. I mean, yeah, right, it, yeah, it, right. Yeah. Quite we started it all. <laughs> that in the, in the 2000s, uh, that dance craze uh, hit because yeah. of dental. No, right. I have a video. Fun. I have a video of myself doing that too. Nice, popping, nice. Right? That's so I'll show you that one day. So. Great. Can't wait. No, but uh, I, I speak. I speak in in a little bit of joke. I do apologize um, with that information. Um, we want to thank you all for taking the time and being with us today. Please stay safe, stay healthy, have a wonderful day, and stay warm, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Take take care now. Bye-bye. Happy New Year.